You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, Internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. If you're 85 or younger, would you like peace of mind and comfort for your family? We're Final Expense Direct with an urgent message for you. The average funeral today costs over $8,000, but the most you'll get from government benefits is $255. How will your family pay the difference? We can help. Our senior plans start as low as just a dollar a day and pay up to $30,000 for a funeral and other final expenses. Peace of mind is easy. There's no medical exam. You'll have lifetime coverage, and your plan can't be canceled as long as you pay your premiums. Call now for free information about our senior plans. Answer a few simple questions and receive approval right on the phone. Plus, call right now and we'll give you a discount prescription card for free. Call 800-553-8687. That's 800-553-8687. Again, 800-553-8687. KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. 
takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. We believe in the American way And we built this country called the USA And we fly our flag cause we're proud and free We're Americans Red, white, and blue is our way of life we never back down from a challenge or a fight Nature provides, God gives the rights We're Americans We fish the waters and we hunt the lands We force the steel with our own two hands we do the best we can, we're Americans. This is Rio of Madison Rising, and you're listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. It's time now for the Conservative Curmudgeon Radio Show. Now, here's Grouchy. There we go. All right, we got a direct hit. Good evening and welcome back into the program, ladies and gentlemen. Good to be with you again. We're going to start the night like we always do. We got a couple things to talk about that aren't really scripted that we really need to talk about. They just happened so late in the game, I didn't have time to rewrite the show. Uh, we have our new Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, on the way home with what was uh, three captive Americans from North Korea. They are all said to be in good health and doing well. Now, this in itself, considering what happened last year with Otto Warmbier, um, is, is quite an accomplishment. Um, the fact that these people are coming home at all, let alone in good health, uh, would would seem like a minor miracle. Now, I don't want to go overboard, but there is credit due to the Trump administration on this, and and I think a lot of credit due. But we're gonna we're gonna recognize this for what it is. Okay, this was this was a good thing done by the Trump administration and executed by Secretary of State Pompeo. This does not make Trump some kind of deity. And I saw a bunch of this today, and it's very disturbing. And look, I get it. You want to support the man. I understand supporting him. But you have to be fair in calling balls and strikes. Okay? This man is not a god. He is not a deity. He is not some superhero. He's a man. He's a man that sits at the head of the greatest nation on earth. And, you know, we have to recognize that. We have to give him credit where it's due. At the same time, at the same time, we have to call attention to what he does badly. That doesn't mean we don't support him. You can disagree with somebody and still support him. I'm just tired of the stupidity from both sides. And, and for that matter, I'm tired of the stupidity in the middle. So why don't all you stupid people do me a favor and just shut the hell up? Call it like it is. That's all I'm saying. Whether you're for the man, whether you're against the man. Now, now listen, this, okay, look, I understand not being for him but I don't understand being against him. Okay. I don't understand that because if you're against him as the leader of the country, you're basically against the country as we stand. Now I didn't like a lot of the policies that Barack Obama set forth during his time in office, 
Um, I, I didn't like most of the policies that he set forth in his time in office. But I never rooted against him. I never wanted him to fail because that means the country fails. I don't know why that's so hard for people to see, but it's just like stupid blinders went on with this last election cycle. Yes, his policies were horrid, horrid, and Trump is showing us that, okay? That doesn't make Trump a god any more than it made Reagan a god when he came into office and showed us the way to economic prosperity as a nation. These are men, and men do good things, and men do bad things, and that's okay, because we are, after all, only human. Now, there were a couple of other things I was going to mention, blah, 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 it doesn't really matter, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on it, because I have more notes than we're going to ever even get through with tonight. Um, first up, I need to tell you after my show tonight, Jesse's POV, and then later tonight, America off the rails with Rowdy Rick, do yourself a favor and stay tuned for those. Also next week, next week, a very special event. I'm going to be doing a crossover show with the crew from FUBAR. They are going to join me on my show, and we're going to end the show, and then I'm going to directly jump over and join them on theirs, where the conversation will continue. So with Polita Bunny and the opulent Amish, they will be with me. I will be with them all next week. So you're going to definitely want to hang out for that. Uh, we got some interesting topics that we're going to be throwing around and, and getting our uh, hot takes on and, and digging in and seeing what we can discover and, and do. So you're going to want to tune in for that. Now, to get things rolling here tonight, imagine, if you will, living in a state where you have to take a vote in your legislature about whether our national motto, in God we trust, will be voluntarily displayed in your schools. Well, this happened. This happened, and congratulations to the state of Minnesota, whose legislature passed this measure by a vote of 38 to 29. This amendment was introduced by State Senator Dan Hall, uh, and it states, to the extent funds or in-kind contributions are available under paragraph B, a school board may prominently display in a conspicuous place in each school an easily readable, durable poster, framed copy, or mounted plaque of the national motto of the United States in God we trust. This just doesn't sound like it's a real hard thing. So in addition, the amendment went on to say, a school board may accept non-public funds or in-kind contributions to implement this section. This means that the signs can be donated by, or, or the money for the signs can be donated by churches, nonprofit organizations, parents, whoever, just any, any kind of non-public funding. So according to Senator Hall, uh, he said it seemed like God and country are no longer lifted in places of honor, and too often God and country are seen as subjects of jokes or ridicule. Our national motto can bring us back to a freedom of faith, even in our schools, he said. This amendment allows our national motto, In God We Trust, back on the walls of our schools as a reminder of hope and tolerance. I like it. 
I like it on a couple of different reasons. But as always, we have to examine everything from both sides. So here we have, and, and you're going to love this because this is what they call themselves up there. Several members of the Democratic Farmer Labor Party. How does that, doesn't that have a nice Soviet kind of ring to it? Democratic Farmer Labor Party. They voiced their opposition and they said they think it sends a, a fairly strong and unmistakable signal to young people of a variety of different religious perspectives and beliefs that their perspective, their belief, their presence in that particular building when they're greeted by a sign like this is not tolerated or respected, said State Senator Scott Dibble. Uh, Dibble offered an amendment to Hall's amendment, which replaces God with Yahweh, or the term for God in the Jewish religion. Uh, Dibble's amendment was defeated in a voice vote. State Senator Melissa Franzen spoke against Hall's amendment, saying that she believes there is a place for religious sentiments and religious slogans and monuments and so forth. And that should be the privacy of our homes, not in the public sphere of our agencies, in particular, not our schools. Apparently, Senator Franzen doesn't understand how our country was founded, which, I mean, that's really not surprising. I would, I would place money on a bet that over half of the state legislators across this nation don't understand how our nation was founded. Um, she continued saying, uh, we might do better, frankly, if the parents taught the values in their own homes. Oh, see, now they're getting about this. But <laughs> the hypocrisy, the hypocrisy is astounding. Because if you have kids that are taught Christian values in the homes and then they come to school and repeat those things, they're considered hateful. So you can't win. They're, they're going to spin the argument one way or the other. You, you absolutely cannot win this argument. But um, she said, you know, her standpoint is that religious values ought not to be taught in schools. Uh, and Senator Ron Latz said, I oppose the posting of that motto in our schools I even would strongly make the case that we ought not to have that motto, something we can't change on our money. Uh, the money I carry in my wallet has to say, in God we trust, and I think that's offensive. Well, let me tell you something, Senator. You don't have to carry that money in your wallet. You can feel free to send it to me via the KLRN studios. Uh, I'm sure that I can put it to good use for you. I'd be, I'd be happy, more than happy, to take all that offensive money off your hands. So if you're interested in the entire bill, uh, you can go to the Minnesota Senate page. Uh, it is SF 3086. You can read the entire text of it, and I believe uh, they even carry the proposed amendments that were either added or defeated. So, I mean... Just the fact that they have to go and fight to have our national motto displayed in their schools, it's a travesty. It's absolutely a travesty. Anyway, I wanted to get that out there. I, you know, I know it only relates to one state, but there's something for all of us in that. And I felt that was a very important story to bring up. And it's one you're not going to hear about in the news. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Man, the allergies are killing me. All right. So, now on to bigger stories that we all know about. The number of unemployed Americans, or a number of employed Americans, excuse me, uh, wrong administration, right? <laughs> the number of employed Americans has broken eight records since President Trump took office. 
But on the not so sunny side, the number of Americans not in the labor force also keeps increasing. Now, I know you're, you're wondering how is this happening, and we're going to get into that. Don't worry. Um, last month, a record 95,745,000 Americans were counted as not in the labor force, meaning they are not employed and are not seeking a job. This is according to the Labor Department's Bureau of Statistics. This category includes retired persons, students, those taking care of children or other family members, and others who are neither working nor seeking work. Now, with record numbers of people not in the labor force, the labor force participation rate has remained stubbornly low in recent years. In April, only 62.8 of the non-institutionalized civilian population over the age of 16 was either working or actively looking for work. Now, this compares with an all-time high of 67.3% in the first four months of 2000. Okay, so we, we have all that going on. And, uh, you know, in, in March of 2018, uh, the Congressional Budget Office noted that a lower labor force participation rate is associated um, with um, lower gross domestic product and lower tax revenues. It is also associated with larger federal outlays because people who are not in the labor force are more likely to enroll in federal benefit programs, including Social Security. And uh, excuse me here, I'm trying to gather my notes. And, and this past January, the CBO projected the labor force participation rate will continue to decline over the next 30 years from the current 62.8% to 61% in 2027 and 59% in 2047. Now, according to that report, the continued retirement of the baby boomer generation is the most important factor driving the numbers. The first baby boomers, and these are people born between 1946 and 1964, turned 65 in 2011. CBO has identified three factors pushing down the participation rate and three factors pushing it up in future years as follows. On the downside, we have younger workers who are replacing baby boomers in the labor force tend to participate in the labor force at lower rates. This means that Junior needs to get off his butt and go to work and get out of mommy and daddy's house. Secondly, the share of people receiving disability insurance benefits is generally projected to continue increasing and people who receive such benefits are less likely to participate in the labor force. Hey, you don't say you give them free money and they don't want to work. Who would have figured? Third, the marriage rate is continued uh, or is projected to continue declining, especially among men and unmarried men tend to participate in the labor force at lower rates than married men. Now, on the upside, the population is becoming more educated and workers with more education tend to participate in the labor force at higher rates. Uh, second, the racial and ethnic composition of the population is changing in ways that increase participation in the labor force. The CBO expects Hispanics to make up an increasing share of the population, which would increase the overall labor force participation rate, and it expects non-Hispanic whites to make up a diminishing share, which would decrease the participation rate, resulting on net in an increase. Now, how is that, you say? Well, that's because Hispanics are having more children than whites. That's how. And over time, that will factor in. 
Third and last, increasing longevity is expected to lead people to work longer. So that and uh, the fact that the government's going to go broke and you won't be able to retire on what they're uh, taking out of your paycheck and storing for later anyway. And uh, I'm working on getting a friend of mine on the program one night. We're going to talk about that a whole lot more about uh, we, we brought this up once before, but I want to have a financial expert on to explain why we are different than what Greece is going through and also while why we're still susceptible to what Greece is going through monetarily over there with their government in such turmoil and, and having such money problems. So anyway, um, you know, that's that. But <sighs> we get to shift gears. We're going to shift to the left. No, not politically left. Well, kind of politically left. But we're going to go to the left coast. You see, if Democrats had their way, every single young person in this country would have no choice but to go through the public education system, during which time they would all be indoctrinated with left-wing, anti-conservative propaganda. They strongly believe in the idea that the state, not the parents, but the state, should have more of a say in the upbringing of children. That's why it shouldn't come as a surprise to learn that the state of California actually tried to pass a bill that could have done away with homeschooling forever. Now, the bill, due to lack of support, was ultimately pulled, but this is something that could very easily be revisited or snuck in a back door somewhere, and people need to be on the watch for this kind of thing. Initially scheduled to be heard on April 25th, this bill would have required the superintendent of education in the state of California to establish a broadly representative and diverse advisory committee to advise the superintendent and the state board of education on all appropriate matters relative to homeschools, which the bill would define. Additionally, the bill states that starting on or before July of 2020, the advisory committee would have been required to make recommendations regarding the appropriateness and feasibility of proposed requirements on home schools and would also require the superintendent and state board to make recommendations to the legislature and governor regarding additional requirements on homeschooling. Now, hang on, hang on. Don't jump too far. The bill goes on to explain exactly what they mean by additional requirements, stating that they shall include, but are not limited to, minimum qualifications for home school instructors and additional content or curriculum standards. Now, they didn't go into full specifics when discussing what the quote unquote minimum qualifications for homeschool instructors would be. But in the far left state of California, who can, you know, you can only imagine what it would be. You know, will parents be forced to teach their children common core math? Well, they have to have a master's degree in order to be able to homeschool anyway. Uh, will they be forced to teach their children that there are 64 genders instead of two? Well, they have no choice but to tell their kids that man is the sole contributor to global warming. Now, the possibilities as to what they mean by additional content or curriculum standards are endless. I mean, really, I, they could say whatever the hell they want. The truth is, is that the state of California, or in the state of California, even though this bill failed, individual liberty is becoming non-existent. Um, you know, they, they, they also passed SB 277, uh, which ultimately threatened to eliminate the freedom of parents to decide against vaccinating a child. They were going to, they were going to state force you to vaccinate. Now, don't get me wrong. 
I'm not a non-vaxxer. Excuse me. Not a non-vaxxer. I, I happen to think vaccines do just fine. I don't believe that they cause disease. I don't believe there's any proof that shows they cause disease. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Show me some proof. And not anecdotal whatever, but proof. Okay? So... The governor's office issued the following statement regarding the passage of SB 277. Uh, the governor believes that vaccinations are profoundly important and a major public health benefit, and any bill that reaches his desk will be closely considered. Um, that means he's going to sign it because he's so in tune. you, you got to understand, the state of California – doesn't just operate under a majority of having Democrat representation. The Democrats own a supermajority in California's legislature. That means that anything that any Republican proposes can simply be tossed out by the Democratic supermajority. There's absolutely zero chance for conservative-hearted legislation in California to even get heard on the state floor. So, you know, and there was another bill, and I don't really want to go into it because it, it reached a little further. Um, this was the, uh, oh, what was it? Assembly Bill 2943, uh, that would have that would make it uh, an unlawful business practice to participate in a transaction intended to result or that results in the sale or lease of goods or services to any consumer that advertises or engages in sexual orientation change efforts with an individual. Now, there was all kinds of hubbub about this bill. This was the bill that, that people thought could ban the sale of the Bible in the state of California. And we're not going to go real deep into this because it's so wild. Um, the way the bill was written, uh, it, it could have banned. They, the, uh, the sponsors of the bill said that was not the intention and they would not let that happen. But again, who can you trust out there? Who can you trust? Anyway, all right, we're bottom of the hour. We've got to take a quick break. Uh, we'll do a short one. We're going to come right back. Do yourself a favor. Stay tuned. we got some big numbers coming at you next. Oh, but ain't that America, you and me? Ain't that America, something to see, baby? Ain't that America, home of the free? My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq. Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible. Affordable. Relevant. Call 800-910-1370. Tired of paying outrageous prices for Viagra? Well, we have great news for you. Now you can finally get Viagra at huge discounts. Healthy Man allows you to save up to $500 on Viagra. Why pay U.S. pharmacy prices of $15 per pill or more when you can get Viagra for less than $3 a pill? Call today and get 40 Viagra pills for only $99. This can cost as much as $600 at your local pharmacy. You can't afford not to call us. If you want Viagra at the lowest prices, never pay $15 
$3 a pill pharmacy prices again. Get Viagra for less than $3 a pill. Call 1-800-516-7602 today and save up to $500 and get 40 pills for just $99. Healthy Man is fast, easy, and affordable. Operators are waiting at 1-800-516-7602 to take your call right now. Call 1-800-516-7602. That's 1-800-516-7602. Again, 1-800-516-7602. Attention business owners and independent contractors. This is a money-saving message from Tax Mediation Services. If your business owes $20,000 or more in taxes, we can help you today, right now. Listen, dealing with the IRS is no picnic. It's an intimidating and extremely stressful process, and you don't want to go it alone. Our attorneys know every law, every tax break, and every possible opportunity to help you resolve and reduce your tax debt. And if you owe more than $20,000, you may be at the top of their hit list. So don't take your tax debt lightly because it will not go away on its own. The IRS can seize your bank accounts, your home, and even shut down your business. Call our tax experts today at 1-800-783-0810 and let us deal with the IRS while you focus on your business. That's 1-800-783-0810. Again, that's 800-783-0810. Oh, but ain't that America, you and me, ain't that America, something to see, baby, ain't that America, home of the free, yeah. All right, welcome back, welcome back. Uh, we're going to tear through this next half hour and see how much of this stuff we can get in. Uh, again, programming reminder, Jesse's POV follows me tonight, and then a little later, Rowdy Rick with America Off the Rails, and uh, we're going to jump right back in. In the first quarter of 2018, the number of Social Security beneficiaries topped $62 million for the first time ever. Now, we just went through some of the reasons in, in the employment report about why that number is increasing. Now, uh, people receiving Social Security benefits, uh, we well, we now have more people receiving Social Security benefits in the United States than the population of Italy. So, ta-da, whatever that's supposed to mean. Social Security ended the fourth quarter of 2017 was 61.903 million, and by the end of the first quarter of this year, that had risen to 62.233. So, uh, Italy is the 23rd most populous nation uh, on the globe, so we now have more people living off the government than we do in Italy. Uh, Again, for whatever I guess just for comparison's sake of size and population, that's why they went there. Um, Anyway, uh, in March, uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there were 127.434 million full-time workers in the United States, uh, which is roughly a third-ish, I guess, about a third, maybe a a tad more than a third of the the population of the country. Um, That means there were approximately 2.05 full-time workers in this country for every person receiving Social Security benefits. Uh, Total employment in the United States in March, including those only working part-time, was 155,178,000. That amounts to 2.49 people with some type of job per person collecting Social Security benefits. The 62.233 million beneficiaries at the end of the first quarter of this year included 45.876 million retired workers and their dependents, uh, right at 6 million survivors of deceased workers, and just a shade more than 10 million disabled workers and their dependents. The Social Security program includes old age and survivor's insurance and disability insurance. Uh, These are supported respectively by payroll taxes 
of ten dollars three or ten point zero three percent and two point three seven percent applicable to the first one hundred twenty eight thousand four hundred dollars of a worker's income. Uh, Self-employed individuals pay the entire combined 12.4% directly. Those employed by someone else split the tax with their employer. So the maximum Social Security tax for a self-employed person in 2018 will be $15,921.60. Uh, the Social Security taxes the government collects this year will not be enough to cover the benefits it pays out, according to Social Security Board of Trustees. But in the past, when the revenues from Social Security taxes exceed the annual cost of the program, the federal government borrowed money and spent it on other things. <laughs> shocking. Just shocking. Uh, the Treasury now uses non-Social Security revenues to pay interest to the Social Security program for the money it previously borrowed and spent. Without this interest, according to the latest report from Social Security trustees, the program will have been in the red since 2010. However, when interest income is excluded, Social Security's cost is projected to exceed its non-interest income throughout the projection period, as it has since 2010. So, you know, it's, it's more of kicking the can down the road. Nobody really wants to step forward and do what needs to be done to fix Social Security, or, or let's just, let's just uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, do away with it and, and privatize everything and give everybody their money back with their interest so they can go and privatize their retirement account. And let's see how that goes. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. We've got to do something one way or the other. Just simply kicking the can down the road and stealing interest payments from one place to throw back into Social Security because we took money out of Social Security that we weren't supposed to to start with. It's crap. It's just, it's that simple. It's plain crap. And uh, whatever. It is. So we're pressing on. Uh, Mueller's investigation got dealt a blow this past week. Uh, the courts were not kind uh, in, in the Justice Department's gamesmanship on the Russia probe, also known as the Mueller investigation, uh, an investigation in which the uh, case prosecutors uh, are to try. Uh, what the hell did I write? <laughs> anyway. It's supposed to be about Russia, but prosecutors don't want to try to do anything about Russia because they know they have nothing with Russia. So first, in the Eastern District of Virginia, where Paul Manafort is facing one of the two indictments against him, uh, Judge T.S. Ellis hammered Mueller's prosecutors over the issues we have been hammering for a year. First up, uh, in appointing Mueller on May 17th, uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein failed to comply with federal regulations that control special counsel investigations. Second up, the secret August 2nd memo by which Rosenstein attempted to uh, paper over his dereliction is facially uninformative and heavily redacted that the subjects of the investigation, the courts, and the public are still in the dark. The factual basis for a criminal investigation is still unknown. Listen to that, folks. Still unknown. As are the boundaries of Mueller's jurisdiction. With Mueller's prosecutors paying lip service to the notion of limits, even as they argue that essentially there are none. Uh, Judge Ellis was a little ornery with prosecutors at Friday's hearing, uh, and... and he was particularly blunt about two other issues uh, that have been highlighted. Uh, the two special counsel's mandate to probe Russia's meddling in 2016's election. Uh, so one can only conclude that Mueller is squeezing Manafort, the former campaign manager, to get him to cooperate against President 
Mueller's investigation is really about seeking a basis to impeach Trump. Um, now, the, the harder questions, uh, you know, they've been being asked. People are asking them. But it's just you can't get anybody in the mainstream to really bite down on this. Um, so the special counsel and the Justice Department are dealing with a federal judge, a skeptic they can't afford to ignore. Uh, and, and for those who are inclined to believe Manafort is a sleazeball, it bears mention that he is unlikely to benefit from Judge Ellis's doubts about the Mueller uh, or about Mueller's authority. Uh, in the end, Mueller will probably be able to keep his case on track, even if he is bruised along the way. So, uh, and then even if the original appointment of Mueller is infirm. Uh, Rosenstein's August 2nd memo clearly authorized him to prosecute Manafort on the offenses involving Ukraine. The judge may not like it, but the court has no business telling the Justice Department what the prosecutor can assign to a case. And even if the judge is right, and he is, uh, about why Mueller is so aggressively pursuing Manafort, there is nothing illegal or unusual about that process. Prosecutors pressure suspects to help roll up other suspects all the time. It's part of the legal game. So what Manafort has to do is buckle under, stay strong, and he's got to know that if this thing shakes out in the end to where he's really sunk, he's going to get pardoned. I just don't see any way around it. Uh, I mean, come on. Trump pardoned Arpaio. I mean, there. look. I get it. They, they should have just left Joe alone, whatever. Um, there was no real standing to pardon Arpaio. So anyway, uh, the judge will pressure Mueller to disclose the currently redacted uh, four-fifths of the Rosenstein memo, uh, the part that says anything other than to whom it may concern and sincerely Rod Rosenstein, Deputy Attorney, U.S. General. Uh, you know, uh, so he's, he's going to pressure Mueller to disclose what's in the redacted portions, uh, which purportedly would describe Mueller's jurisdiction in a manner compliant with federal regulations. But there, there has been way too much secrecy in this investigation. And the FBI has been investigating for two years a year before Mueller took the helm. So by now, we should be told what crimes, if any, the memo says the president may have committed. I mean, you know, there may be some good faith reasons related to investigate uh, in secrecy and protecting the reputations of uncharged people that justify a, a couple of redactions. On the other hand, you know, here it is. It could be that the Justice Department relied on the unverified Steele dossier in describing the factual basis for a special counsel's investigation. That's something we should know one way or the other. Uh, even if Rosenstein and Mueller would rather not say. It doesn't matter. We should know. But... Let's say Mueller stands strong and refuses to disclose the memo's description of his jurisdiction and insisting that Judge Ellis is entitled to see only the thin Manafort paragraphs that have already been revealed. If Ellis reacts by dismissing the indictment, uh, any appeal would go to the Fourth Circuit, which after eight years of Obama has turned sharply to the left. So in that forum, it's highly likely that Mueller would win, uh, at least uh, if a prosecutor can call it winning when the prize for getting his indictment reinstated is a trip back to the lower court where he gets to litigate the case before the same ornery district judge that just got reversed. So anyway, um, then we have Judge Friedrich and the Russian troll farm case in Washington uh, where Mueller brought the case he's charged that involves Russian interference in the 2016 campaign, we noted that it was uh, more than theater, more theater than prosecution. The Russian defendants are all beyond U.S. jurisdiction, so there would be no trial, and thus no possibility that the allegations would ever be tested in court. 
it seemed like a perfect opportunity for the special counsel to try the narrative, uh, an indictment asserting something that, however highly probable, would be very difficult to prove beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal trial, namely that the Russian regime meddled in the U.S. election. So here's the, here's the way to look at this. When prosecutors are serious about nabbing lawbreakers who are at large, they do not file an indictment publicly. They would just induce the offenders to flee or remain in their safe havens. Uh, instead, prosecutors filed their indictment under seal, uh, or you know, they file their indictment under seal, ask the court to issue arrest warrants, and quietly go about the business of locating and apprehending the defendants charged. That's if they want, if they really want to bring them to court. In the Russia case, however, the indictment was filed publicly, even though the defendants are at large. That is because the Justice Department and the special counsel know the Russians will stay safely in Russia. Mueller's allegations will never be tested in court. That makes his indictment more a political statement than a charging instrument to the extent that there are questions about whether Russia truly meddled in the election. The special counsel wants to end that discussion although his indictment will not satisfy those skeptical about Russia's responsibility for hacking Democratic accounts or who wonder why the FBI and Justice Department never physically examined the DNC servers. So, figuring that he was playing with the uh, House money, Mueller made a reckless bet. He charged not only Russian individuals, but three Russian businesses. Uh, a business doesn't have the same risks as a person, a business can't be thrown in jail, and while members of Mueller's prosecutorial stable have a history of putting real businesses out of business, a business that is run by a Putin crony and serves as a front for Kremlin operations is probably not too worried about Robert Mueller's team. And uh, one of those Russian businesses, Concord Management and Consulting, <laughs> they want their day in court. It's retained the Washington law firm of Reed Smith, uh, two of whose partners, uh, Eric uh, Dublier and Kathleen Sykley, uh, have told Mueller that Concord is ready to have its trial. And by the way, let's see all the discovery the law requires you to disclose, including all the evidence you say supports the extravagant allegations to in the indictment. Uh, now, needless to say, Mueller's team is not happy about this development. Uh, since its case, or since this is not a case they figured on having to prosecute uh, to anything more than a successful press conference. So they've saw a delay <laughs> on the astonishing ground that the defendant has not been properly served. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. We're, we're asking for a delay because we haven't served a subpoena to this defendant yet, uh, but you've charged him. Now, understand, services process, or service of process is simply the means by which a party seeks what Mueller has already got the opposing party's appearance in the lawsuit. Mueller's argument is so priceless <laughs> that you, you just have to chuckle at it. I mean, it's just great. Uh, in order to serve the defendants in a criminal case in which Mueller alleges that Russia is an adversary government that conducted espionage operations against the American election, the Justice Department sought the assistance of, yes, the government of Russia. <laughs> And this may surprise you, this may surprise you, but Russia has never gotten back to them on this. Now, I'm betting that Concord's appearance in court is Russia's way of getting back to them. <laughs> it's quite funny, actually. It really is. Uh, it, it's, it's like taking the, the fork and sticking it back in the hot dog and turning it. <laughs> Even <laughs> Mueller's over the fire now, and he hates it. So the federal court in the District of Columbia has scheduled Concord's arraignment uh, for tomorrow. Or I'm sorry, that would have been today. So Mueller filed his papers 
late last Friday to try to get the matter postponed. Uh, but as Politico reporter uh, Josh Gerstein wrote in Saturday evening, uh, Judge Dabney Friedrich uh, curtly denied Mueller's request. Mueller's prosecutors had suggested that weeks of briefing were necessary to probe the question of whether Concord had been served properly. As Concord has voluntarily appeared, however, it is not apparent why that question needs examination. If he wants to stand on ceremony, Mueller could just hand the lawyers a copy of the indictment when they see each other in court this week. Now, Concord's lawyers have been scrutinizing the indictment very carefully already and making demands for discovery that they say Mueller has ignored for weeks. Uh, and to put it mildly, this is not a case the special counsel is anxious to, to even bring in front of a court. Uh, he's even less thrilled at the prospect of disclosing his evidence, which he has to do, uh, and investigative files to a business controlled by Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin. Now, apart from being close to Vladimir Putin, Prigozhin is personally charged as a defendant in the case. He controls not just Concord, but all three businesses charged in the indictment. So by indicting Russian businesses that belong to a Kremlin-connected defendant who cannot be forced to leave Russia, Mueller risked exactly what has happened. One of the businesses showing up to contest the case at no risk, in effect forcing Mueller to show his Kremlin-connected defendant what he's got. He's got to put his cards down. Even though he has no chance of getting the Kremlin-connected defendant convicted and sentenced to prison. The surest way to put an, an end to this unwelcome turn of events would be to dismiss the indictment or at least drop the charges against the three businesses so Prigozhin and the Kremlin can't use them to force Mueller's hand. Of course, you know, that would be pretty embarrassing for Mueller. Uh, but as all prosecutors are taught from their first day on the job, never indict a case unless you're prepared to try the case. Now, folks, we're getting back around close to the top of the hour. We're not going to have time to do another uh, another headline and story here. But uh, I want to I want to remind you again, Jesse's POV is coming up next. Rowdy Rick with America off the rails later tonight. And next week, the big crossover event with the crew from FUBAR. They will join me first. I will join them immediately after. It's going to be big fun. Uh, I know for a fact we're going to be talking about the opioid epidemic in this country. Uh, and we're going to be talking about identity politics. And I believe we're going to be talking climate change. Uh, yeah, this, this is going to be good stuff. You're going to want to be around for this next week. I promise you that. Um, we'll, between their show and mine, no time differences. You know, It's all going to be at the same time you're used to. We're just going to do me over here, and then I'm going to jump with them over there. That's all it's going to be. Big crossover show. They're great friends. I love them both. And uh, we're going to have a good time doing this. And we're looking forward to having you here with us. And that's it for tonight, folks. So uh, if you like the show, tell your friends. If your friends like the show, you need new ones. But they and you are welcome here with me every week right here on KLRN Radio for the Conservative Curmudgeon Show. Peace and God bless. We Life. Never back down from a challenge or a fight Nature provides, God gives the rights We're Americans We fish the waters and we hunt the lands We force the steel with our own two hands I hate this place, nothing works here Medications don't work, I've been here for seven years This is real